Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237, Come at you with another review. <clears throat> now, my last video, I finally wrapped up my uh, Hammer Dracula series. And I know I got a bunch of other marathons to do. I still got to finish Universal Monsters. Of, then get to Alfred Hitchcock, Bela Lugosi box set, uh, Vincent Price films, Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe films, anthology films. But in between those, I do have some standalone films that I've gotten recently that I'm going to do throughout just to break it up for both you guys and myself. And <clears throat> this is one of those standalone kind of random films, I guess. And it is one of the best films I've seen in a long time. And this is also the favorite film of a great subscriber of mine uh cynthia sin this is her favorite film with her favorite actress uh, you know she, she didn't request this but she said it in one of our conversations and comments and it's a movie i've been wanting to see for a while anyway so even though it's not a request this review is kind of for her and that is 1962's whatever happened to baby jane starring betty davis and joan crawford this is a phenomenal, phenomenal, very well-made film. <clears throat> it was way better than I expected. Nominated for five Oscars. It's one of those uh, horror films that I think people are trying to say psychological thriller. Because it was so heavily acclaimed and well-received and nominated for Oscars. Sort of like Oscar horror, you know, like Rosemary's Baby or The Omen or The Exorcist. Goddamn tissues. The Exorcist, Silence of the Lambs. <clears throat> I don't think Psycho was nominated, which blows my fucking mind, but nominated for five Oscars. It won only for um, Best Costume Design for a black and white film. But, uh, Betty Davis was nominated for her role as Baby Jane Hudson. And I can't express how great this movie is. It really was awesome. I mean, it is it is a horror film. Yeah, it is a psychological thriller as well. Um, for fans of movies like Stephen King's um, A Misery, which I'm a huge fan of, it's my favorite Stephen King adaptation. Shining's my favorite film, but it's not a good adaptation. Misery is my favorite adaptation. It's also my favorite Stephen King book. <clears throat> there are some similarities, you know, mentally ill, unstable woman keeping someone captive. But it's for different reasons. The performances are absolutely outstanding. Not just from the two leads, Davis and Crawford, but also um, there's this guy, uh, uh, Victor Buono, who I believe this was his first film, or his first major film. Uh, he would go on to play King Tut in the Adam West uh, Batman series. He was nominated for an Oscar for this as well, for his acting. Based on the novel by uh, Henry Farrell, Music by Frank Duvall. Great score. It was produced and directed by Robert Aldrich. And this is just... This is one of those movies where not just the performances are great, but everything along with it. Not just the cinematography and the music, which is also great. But, um, you know, it is so full of mood, atmosphere... You know, claustrophobia, because you're you're in this mansion for almost the whole film. Especially the bedroom of Joe Crawford's character, Blanche. Uh, anxiety, tension, suspense. You know, any sign of hope or help there is that Blanche has, it's kind of squashed. And, you know, Betty Davis as Baby Jane Hudson went down as one of the greatest 
you know, female villains in film history. It's probably my second favorite performance by an actress after Kathy Bates uh, for Misery. <clears throat> and I know I have seen Betty Davis before. I'm not sure what films, but I've never seen Joe Crawford in a film before. In fact, I think I've always known her as uh, Bobby Dearest. And again, that's up to speculation for how true that is. But yeah, Joe Crawford, I always figured she was like that. And I didn't really know a lot about this film before I saw it. So I figured if there was a villain, I figured Joe Crawford, you know, allegedly being a psycho in real life. But you really feel bad for Joe Crawford in this film. Right up until the end. The end really has... There's this twist that just makes you... Like, all the feelings you had towards both of them. It really conflicts you. During that final revelation in the last scene. Alright, six minutes in. What the hell is this about? <clears throat> um, the film opens up in 1917. Uh... uh Baby Jane Hudson is this uh, child actress in vaudeville. Huge star, kind of like a Shirley Temple type actress. You know, song and dance, everyone loved her. She's nine years old. The... Um, Joe Crawford was the elder sister, correct? Because that's how it was at first. Jane was the big star. Yeah. Blanche was living in her shadow. But then in 1935, Blanche had become the star and Jane was kind of forgotten about. And they're at this house party one night and Jane is doing these impressions of Blanche and kind of mocking her. <clears throat> and she's drunk. And then we see this accident happened where this car crashes into the gates of this mansion and you know we're, which you know pins her between the car and the gate she is then paralyzed from the waist down confined to a wheelchair with Jane having to take care of her so now it's uh, present day 1962 they're living in this mansion Blanche is confined to a wheelchair upstairs, like in her bedroom. They do have a, uh, a housemaid that doesn't live with them, but her name's Elvira. But <clears throat> mostly it's Jane that has to look after her. And Jane is a very erratic alcoholic. She resents her fame. She thinks her fame was taken away from her because she was always blamed for the accident that it was done on purpose. Because she was found three days later in a drunken stupor. <clears throat> but I guess the studio kind of worked it out so she was never tried for it. And, you know, it starts off kind of small and the film is just constantly building and building. You know, like Elvira brings all this fan mail for her. That she never received because Jane throws it away. Um, and you know, Betty, da uh, Betty Davis is so great at just playing a vindictive, evil, psycho bitch. <laughs> <clears throat> like, one of the first things she does is she takes the birdcage downstairs to clean it. It's her pet bird. And she comes back upstairs and she's like, oh, I was cleaning the cage. Bird flew out the window. She's very cold, very, you know, mean-spirited in how she says things. They're like, oh, you did that on purpose. And she's like, no. it. Like I said, cleaned it, it flew out the window. So then she brings Blanche lunch. And when she opens the lid, there's her dead bird on her food. So, of course, she doesn't eat it. So when Jane brings her her dinner, she's too afraid to look under the lid. Because she doesn't know what she's going to see. So she doesn't eat it. Now she's starving. <clears throat> so Jane is just... 
She's like, you forgot to bring me breakfast. She's like, I didn't forget. You did eat your dinner. She was like, oh, I was too afraid. So Jade goes over, opens it, and it's just a regular meal. Nothing wrong with it. She even picks up like a rib, starts eating it. She's like, you're just being very neurotic. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. So when Blanche realizes it's fine, she's starving. She wants to go have some. But Jay takes the tray and is like, well, you wouldn't eat it. Now you got to wait till lunch. And she's like, oh, by the way, we have rats in the cellar. So she finally breaks her lunch. And when she opens the lid, there's a cellar rat there. You know, it's just this, like, not quite a Machiavellian, but, like, still very methodical kind of psychological torture. And then also... You know, she's trying to sell the house. I think with the plan of getting her sent somewhere where she can be taken care of. But of course, she doesn't want to go anywhere. She's trying to... In her head, her fame's going to come back to her. And when she finds out she's going to sell the house, I mean... There's all these things she does. And like one of the first really suspenseful scenes is... Because she takes the phone from her room. Uh, Jane goes out. So Blanche sitting at the typewriter. Kind of saying the whole situation. Jane comes home. So she can't type because it's loud. So she takes the paper out. And she writes, you know, under no circumstances. Let my sister know the contents of this note. And she tries to throw it out the window to a neighbor. But of course she has to climb up. There's like a gate on the window. But just as she's about to throw it, she pulls in the driveway. And Jane sees her. And she sees the note. So, of course, the neighbor's coming up. She walks up to the neighbor. The note is right there. And, of course, she grabs the note and reads it. That's when she gets the rat. So, you know, it's, there's scenes like that that are kind of like misery where, you know, like he's looking around the house after she goes to buy the right typewriter paper, pulls in the driveway that he's quickly got to get back to his bedroom. It's got scenes like that. Uh, Victor Buono plays this uh, broke uh, a musician that answers an ad for, I guess, someone to keep her company, but also to like play music so she can relive her days as a star she's no longer good at singing or dancing but the guy's desperate and of course she has like no money that's why she wanted to sell the house also and you know there's a part where she goes out so that she goes into her room she plants chocolates she's eating the chocolates and I did realize during that you could tell they added audio of like, and after, because it doesn't quite sync up. But she finds a picture, an autographed picture of herself with the face, you know, marked out. And then another sheet of paper where she practiced forging her signature and then a checkbook. So she's been forging her signature because she has all the money. And... You know, the title kind of comes, wh whatever happened to Baby Jane, because no one remembers her as a star. Like, there's a couple points where she says, I'm Baby Jane Hudson. And people are just kind of like, oh, okay. Who's Baby Jane Hudson? I don't want to give everything away, because this is a great film. Great. It's 1962, but I, I hadn't seen it. You know, it's just over two hours, 133 minutes. But I'm going to say spoilers here. But, I mean, this movie was highly acclaimed. The fact that both Betty Davis and Joe Crawford had a real-life career long, you know, since the 30s, this really a, a bitter rivalry for roles and awards. They really did fucking hate each other. You know, the things people say about Karloff and Lugosi, like times 10 in real life with these two. 
and it really helps with their performance. I mean, <clears throat> you can just tell, like, of course she's the more sympathetic one because she's the victim. But, I mean, eventually she's tied to her chain that she uses to hoist herself up out of bed, get into the chair, and taped. And she is held captive throughout, you know, the whole second half of the film. But, you know, when they actually are conversing with each other, you can feel, like, that a negative chemistry feels so authentic because it's real. They were rivals in real life. And it just helped with their performances tenfold. I think Betty Davis got more uh, notice award-wise because, like, she was nominated for an Oscar. She wasn't. I think they were both nominated for BAFTAs, but I think just her for uh, Golden Globes. I could be wrong on that. Um, okay, they were both nominated for BAFTAs. Uh, it was just Davis for... <clears throat> Only Davis and Buono got nominated for Golden Globes. They got the Laurel Award for the Golden Laurel for the Sleeper of the Year. Because I think this wasn't... They weren't really thinking this was going to be a big film. They thought, oh, maybe we'll get a couple big stars. Maybe have like a modest hit. And it ended up being huge. So if you haven't seen this, definitely go out and see it. Because, I mean, it's up there with Psycho for best movie of definitely the 60s and it's it's one of those movies also you know like uh the only other movie i can think of before this that is that good would have been like the german film m which i reviewed from 1931 you know that just it's like art you know like godfather of horror movies like you know really Masterful making film. I put this up there with Psycho. Because I'm going to go into spoilers. Because I have to talk about the ending. But also. Excuse me. Like uh, uh, the cinematography. Like the film ends on a beach. And just some of the camera angles. And the way it looks. It looks beautiful. It really knows how to build tension. Especially like with it's music. And the timing of everything. Just really magnificent film. So I'm going to get into spoilers now. The the revelation at the end because uh, Victor Bono's character goes over there for his, you know, he's due for his job, but by the end of the film, she is so psychologically gone that she's pretty much resorted to a child. I mean, she still dresses like Baby Jane, like little girls dress, her size, obviously. Has, like, the cute, like, little girl curls in her hair, tons of makeup. But by, like, the third act, she is so gone that she's just like, oh, he hates me. And everyone's going to be mean to me. You know, because she does kill the maid because the maid, you know, Finds out there's something wrong and gets in the room to see her tied up. And so when Victor Buono g goes back over, she uh, knocks over a lamp. It makes a noise and he goes up to look. She's like, oh my gosh, she's dying. And he runs out of the house to get help. So she loads her up in the car and they leave because she knows she's, she's like, He's going to tell. He's going to tell. <clears throat> so they go to the beach. And by this point, it's on the news. Like, former actress Baby Jane Hudson has kidnapped her, her own sister, Blanche, after being held captive for so long. But no one remembers who Baby Jane Hudson is, so she kind of blends into the beach to an extent. I mean, she's building sand castles. She's bouncing a ball with kids, but she illegally parked. 
So that's how the cops get on to her. And Blanche, who is dying, I mean, they did a great job with, you know, her eyes looking sunk in, chapped lips with foam on her mouth. That's when she tells her that she wasn't driving the night of the accident. She was. And she was so drunk that night that she wouldn't let her drive. But she was so mad at her for, um, you know, doing those mocking impressions. Which I, I forgot to mention, they think she was hiding the fan mail because there was this TV studio that was showing all of her old films. So that was bringing out even more jealous rage towards her. Because she was famous, then she became famous, took it away from her. And then the accident happened, but she kind of maintained the more successful one. Um, so the night of the accident, she was so mad that she drove into the gate herself. And when she did that, she snapped her own spine. But then she ran away and she crawled underneath the car at the gate and they assumed it was her. So for almost 30 years, she lived with that lie to make her feel guilty. And that revelation really makes you think of all the psycho shit she's done and all the feelings you have for both these characters. And it just kind of makes you step back and rethink everything you felt. It takes a powerful film with powerful performances and writing and how everything else plays out. To, but then to throw a twist like that that works, you know, it takes a powerful film to make a twist make you rethink everything you felt about everything leading up to that point. I thought it was excellent. Then, of, of course, you know, the cops realize that's who she is. They're like, where's your sister? All these people start crowding around. And in her psychotically gone head, she thinks she's baby Jane again. And this crowd of, you know, onlookers want to see what's going on because they're you know it's public everybody's nosy she just starts dancing like baby jane because she thinks they're all there to watch her but then the cops see her they run up to her but that's where the movie ends it doesn't show or say if she lived or died that's kind of frustrating but this movie was so goddamn good it's so strong so powerful and, you know, so suspenseful and so full of tension and anxiety and powerhouse performances that, you know, you really got to hate this character, feel bad, you know, baby Jane, really feel bad for Blanche. And then just that little revelation at the end just made you rethink everything. Strong film. And, of course, the music by... Uh, Frank Duvall was wonderful. The cinematography was beautiful. You know, the direction by Robert Aldrich. And this is a, a good addition, too. It's a two-disc. It comes with three documentary profiles, Betty and Joan, uh, uh, All About Betty, which is hosted by Jodie Foster, film profile of Joan Crawford, uh, Behind the Scenes, and then uh, a 1962 excerpt with Betty Davis of the Andy Williams show. So yeah, wonderful. And I mean, I had heard of it. I've heard the name before, but I didn't know what kind of film it was. But I mean, there's it's mentioned in this book, which I went over. Of course, it has a chapter as the 101 horror movies you must see before you die. Which I haven't done a video about this book yet, but I will. And just Betty Davis as Baby Jean is one of the greatest female villains ever. And even though I just saw this for the first time, it's she's now in my top three favorite female performances. Either second or third. Number one is still Kathy Bates from Misery. 
And even though I love Misery, and it's a similar kind of concept, I would probably say this is a better made movie with all around better performances, but I still really love Misery. But yeah, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, phenomenal powerhouse film. Excellent, excellent film. And uh, Cynthia Sin, I can see why this is your favorite movie. This movie was excellent. Highly, highly, highly recommend this to anybody. Great movie. Thank you for watching.